Good afternoon. My name is Mark DeLarco, and I serve as the Dean of the College of Graduate Studies and the Interim Vice President for Research and Innovation. And it's my honor to serve as host today for the University Scholar Series presentation of Professor Walter Adams. The University Scholar Series, which is co-sponsored by the Office of the Provost, the SJSU King Library, and the Division of Research and Innovation, provides a forum for the SJSU community and beyond to see the groundbreaking work of some of our eminent scholars. I would like to begin by reading the land acknowledgement. While we gather at San Jose State University, we are gathered on the ethno-historic tribal territory of the Tamian Ohlone, who were the direct ancestors of the lineages enrolled in the Moekma Ohlone tribe and who were missionized into missions Santa Clara, San Jose, and Dolores. The lands on which San Jose State University is established was and continued to be of significance to the Malekwa Ohlone tribe. We also recognize that the ancestors of the Malekwa Ohlone uh, uh, constructed and maintained the three Bay Area missions. Our campus extends to surrounding areas that held a Tupantac, a traditional roundhouse which were once located at the historic Lope Iniego Land Grant uh, Rancho Posoma y Positas de las Animas, and also Marcelo, Pio, and Cristobal Land Grant Rancho Ulistac, which were places of celebration and religious ceremonies, as well as nearby ancestral heritage shell mounds that serve as the tribe's traditional cemetery sites and territorial monuments. San Jose State University also desires to honor the military service of the Mawekma who have honorably served overseas during World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Desert Storm, Iraq, and who are still serving in the United States Armed Forces today. I also would like to uh, cover a couple of housekeeping items. First, we are uh, enabling live captioning and the webinar is being recorded. At the end of the presentation of Professor Adams, we're going to have a question and answer period. If you have a question, please enter it into the Q&A section of the webinar. So with that, I would like to introduce our speaker today. Walter Adams is an Associate Professor of Biological Sciences at San Jose State University. He holds a bachelor's degree in biology from the University of Chicago, a PhD in microbiology and environmental toxicology from the University of California, Santa Cruz, and then conducted his postdoctoral research as an NIH Arachta Scholar at Tufts University School of Medicine. His lab fosters a diverse and inclusive community that prioritizes student-centered research experiences. Their research focuses on understanding the epic battle between white blood cells and bacteria during respiratory infections. He founded the biology department's Innovating Diversity, Access, and Equity, or IDEA, committee, and serves on the College of Science Anti-Racism Committee to promote student success and increase diversity across the sciences. Today, he will be presenting uh, a talk entitled, cleverly I might say, The Whole Problem, Understanding How a Poor Forming Toxin Promotes Respiratory Disease. Professor Adams. Thank you so much, Dean Delarco. I really appreciate it uh, for that very uh, generous and kind introduction. And thank you also to the Office of the Provost for the invitation to give today's uh, talk for as part of the University Scholar Series. So thank you all in, for attending as well. And I'm looking forward to um, getting started with today's talk. So let me go ahead and select the slides. All right. All right, so hopefully everyone can see my screen all right. And we'll get started. So as Mark pointed out, if you didn't notice, there is a pun in the title. And 
there will certainly be more of those throughout the talk, so you have been fairly warned. And to get started, I would first, as I think so many of us like to do, thank the amazing San Jose State students, particularly those in the Adams Lab that are responsible for so much of this amazing research. Our lab is just over five years old, and it is incredible to see all that we've accomplished uh, before the pandemic, during the pandemic, after the pandemic, and also all the fun we've had along the way. So whether it's eating pizza, burritos, or um, dressing up for different Halloween costume competitions, um, or just having fun in general, it's been so rewarding to build this amazing community uh, with these incredible research students. So know that many of the experiments I present to you today um, have been uh, done, performed, analyzed by these students, and there are many more uh, to come. So look forward to uh, where these uh, amazing students head in their next steps. And as I reflect on the community we've built, I've learned so much from these students, including um, the fact that growing up, they uh, didn't quite do the same things that I did. Um, so I love playing the board game Risk, um, which they don't seem to be that familiar with. And I also love reading the book, The Lord of the Rings, uh, which they definitely do not seem to um, really connect with. In fact, most of them haven't even really seen uh, the movie um, or movie series, uh, which I also watched. Um, fortunately, um, they are aware of Game of Thrones and we can bond over the uh, TV seasons um, that have been shown, um, as well as some of the other aspects of the culture and the reason that I highlight these different pop culture references is because they actually serve as very useful analogies to some of the work that we do in the Adams Lab. And in particular, they actually drove my um, inspiration uh, to get more involved in infectious disease research. Because as my lab well knows, um, I often refer to what we study as Game of Thrones under the microscope. Because while all of these board games, books, and shows feature these intense battles uh, with weapons and defenses, the same thing is actually happening every single day, but at a microbial level uh, underneath the microscope in our own bodies. And yes, that is a key difference. While the battles in the pop culture references take place in Middle Earth or Westeros, uh, the battles that we study happen in our own bodies every single day. As I think most of you are, are aware, um, our body is made up of very complex microbial communities that are housed within host tissues and organs. And these microbial communities interface with our human cells every single day. This landscape is where the battles actually take place. And fortunately for us, we have a variety of immune cells or white blood cells that serve as defenders of our body and our tissues. And they do microbial combat with a variety of pathogens um, that seek to colonize and infect our tissues, which can fortunately lead to severe disease and in some cases, death, depending on how the battle is progressing. And so this fascinating interplay um, of microbial battles um, is at the heart and center of our lab's research interests. And while there are many different stories I would love to share with you, the stories that we'll be focusing on today feature one immune cell in particular called a neutrophil, and this is my fair white blood cell, as well as that of many of my lab members, and how it fights with a bacterial pathogen called Streptococcus pneumoniae that is a respiratory pathogen that infects our airways. And together we will be able to um, learn about some of the key discoveries our lab has made um, 
in addition uh, to some of the discoveries made by some of our collaborators. And so to make sure we're all on the same page, because I realize this is a broad audience, um, let me share with you some basic facts about this battle. First, streptococcus pneumoniae is a leading cause of community-acquired pneumonia, um, including um, across the entire world. And in the U.S. alone, there are 150,000 hospitalizations each year. There are a number of susceptible populations, including children under the age of two, the elderly over the age of 65, individuals that smoke, as well as adults with different chronic illnesses. And so this is a major public health concern, both um, because this disease does kill and it also is a huge financial burden on our healthcare system. So when a patient goes in uh, to see if they have pneumonia, which is um, a key disease that streptococcus pneumoniae causes, it is diagnosed most commonly with a chest x-ray. And what we're looking at here is the chest x-ray of a healthy adult. Um, you can clearly see their rib cage, and this is indicative of nice open airways, which is what you want your lungs to be like. You want there to be open spaces for you to breathe. Now, I don't know if the audience is, how many people in the audience have gone to medical school, but you don't have to be an MD to notice that in this next x-ray, you can see, oh my goodness, yes, uh, it is a vast haze, a um, clear um, amount of uh, blockage has now presented itself. Um, you can not make out the, the rib cage clearly. And this is indicative of massive fluid accumulation and cellular influx um, that is present during a pneumonia infection. And so this is not what you want your lungs to look like. This is going to make it very difficult to breathe um, and is one of the unfortunate outcomes um, during this infection. So what's going on? What's going on between our neutrophils who are trying to save the day versus this infectious microbe? Well, to orient you a little bit to each of these players so we can explore this question further, let me first state that Neutrophils are also referred to as polymorphic nuclear leukocytes, or PMNs. And I promise I'll try to keep the jargon to a minimum, um, but there are a few important terms that I want to cover to help orient us for the rest of the talk. So these neutrophils, or PMNs, can release a number of pro-inflammatory molecules, and that's really important because it will um, allow the white blood cells to try to clear the infection, um, and these molecules can cause a lot of damage. They also are able to respond to specific chemotractant gradients. So these are small signaling molecules that lead the neutrophils to a specific site in a tissue or organ. On the other side um, of this equation, we have streptococcus pneumoniae, but let me first highlight that during the talk, I'll use this little cartoon image of the neutrophil uh, to make it simpler for different schematics and models. On the other side here, we have streptococcus pneumoniae, and this is a gram-positive bacterium, which I expect all of my general microbiology students to know uh, the definition of, but this gives um, some assessment as to the uh, structure of the bacteria and how they function at the microbial level. There's also um, a very important pore-forming toxin called pneumolysin, or PLY, as an abbreviation, which um, I have alluded to in the title of the talk and will be a central star to this series of stories that I share. And lastly, there is the fact that streptococcus pneumonia infection has been shown to induce production of hypoxylin, which is a neutrophil chemotractant. Okay, so hopefully you can see the parallels here. This infection leads to the production of molecules that neutrophils will respond to in terms of a um, directionality during the infection. Okay, so now that we're all on the same page about these basics, 
note that to keep the scale the same, Streptococcus pneumoniae will be represented as these uh, small purple um, circles. So how does the disease occur? Well, during Streptococcus pneumoniae pathogenesis, you first will have the asymptomatic colonization of the nasopharynx. And this is important because um, this is a required step for the bacteria to then transit to the lower airways where it can develop pneumonia. And this is classically characterized by a massive influx of PMNs. This is very excessive, right? Traditionally, we think of white blood cells coming to save the day. And unfortunately, um, that is not always the case. If you have too many white blood cells present, um, they can actually do more harm than good. And this is what's happening in pneumonia. This is also associated with massive amounts of tissue damage. So our lung cells are being damaged by this excessive inflammation um, that is associated with all of these white blood cells releasing anti or sorry pro-inflammatory molecules. And so this leads to a lot of chaos in the lungs. We can visualize this by looking at human lung biopsies. And you see here a biopsy of a healthy uh, lung section. You see nice open airways and um, intact tissue that is, again, what you would want your lungs to look like. Now, if you have a discerning eye and look carefully, you can, okay, that is very obvious. You see pneumonia, all right? Uh, there is a ton of damage. There are tons of cells that have come in fluid accumulation, and this inflammation is not great for the progression of the disease or the health of your lungs, okay? So this can occur you have pneumonia, and then this can progress even further to lead to systemic spread. So the bacteria can actually escape from the lungs to the bloodstream, and then this will um, allow the bacteria to enter your brain and cause inflammation there. It's been shown to lead to heart complications and death, right? So all of these outcomes are not great. And this is, again, reinforcing why this bacteria is such a big health concern and problem worldwide. So what are the questions that our lab has been asking to try to fight this disease? Before we get to them, I just wanna quickly orient everyone to our model um, that we'll be using throughout the talk. Um, this is our airways on the right here, and it centers our research questions, right? This is our working scaffold for how we think about the disease. We have a number of different features, including our lung epithelial cells shown here, and they also feature cilia that are these um, uh, structures that are able to help repel bacteria from landing and uh, attacking them, so very important um, for their defense. Um, we also have some other structural components, including tight junctions and adherence junctions, which are structures that connect the different lung epithelial cells. So what you'll see is that you have these tight junctions and adherence junctions interspersed between the different cells. It's sort of how lung cells uh, like to hold hands, all right? And this makes for a nice confluent um, lung epithelium that stays intact and keeps um, infectious particles and particulate out um, of our bodies. So we have this structure set up. Now let's talk about the research questions. First, what are the microbial factors that drive this disease during streptococcus pneumoniae infection? So what are these weapons that the bacteria are using to cause this disease? We also want to know how do these microbial factors impact our immune response? So how do they do that? Um, what are the processes involved? And remember, we have neutrophils, right, on the other side of this um, system that are going to try to fight off the bacteria. And lastly, how do these microbial factors impact the structural integrity of our airways? As 
you might suspect, right? There's a lot of damage that can occur during this infection. So what's happening to that actual structure of our airways? So let's start with the first question. And to answer all of these questions that I'll be talking about today, our lab uses a specific system to try to um, answer um, the question by modulating a number of different variables. And this system is referred to as an in vitro transwell system that we love in our lab because it allows us to model specific host pathogen dynamics during infection. We use this um, system on the lab bench and also in safe um, uh, machines called biosafety cabinets. And basically it allows us to seed lung epithelial cells on these filters. And then we can uh, measure number of different um, variables or benefits such as chemotractant secretion, such as the molecule hypoxylin. And we can also look at multiple cell types, which are important for the infection. In addition to this, uh, we have different Streptococcus pneumoniae strains that we can infect um, our lung cells with. So this is sort of the microbial battle that we are looking at. And in addition, we can also use purified toxins uh, to look at the response by the lung epithelium and the damage that occurs. Specifically, we can look at how these um, strains and toxins affect the adherence junctions and tight junctions that I mentioned earlier, those structural components that are helping the cells stay connected. We can do some gymnastics with regards to the filter itself and the cells. We can grow them under different conditions and then add uh, these purified neutrophils or PMNs from mouse or human donors. And this um, is very powerful because we can simply isolate this um, these cells from blood and then watch them migrate um, across the monolayer as the cells uh, try to fight the bacteria. And um, that's, again, sort of seeing the battle commence um, on the microbial scale. So now that we have this system in place, we can explore what microbial factors drive disease during streptococcus pneumoniae infection. So we're going to start with a very simple experiment where we're just looking at PMN migration across the lung epithelium. And I'll try to include these different um, symbols that are reminders of what we're measuring um, in each of the different experiments that I show you. And this experiment is very straightforward. We are looking at the number of neutrophils migrating. And in response to just adding buffer, we don't get any migration, which is what we would expect. This is a good negative control. If we're just adding a buffer to our system, we wouldn't expect neutrophils to come rushing forward. When we infect with a wild type strain, all right, this is Streptococcus pneumoniae sort of default um, strain with all its weapons. We see this robust neutrophil response, okay? And when we do that same infection, but with a mutant strain that lacks pneumoliacin, this poor forming toxin, we see a significant decrease in the amount of neutrophils present. And remember, these neutrophils, right, are coming through and they're very angry. They're causing a lot of damage. So this result is sort of a foundational result for our lab. It helps us think about a key aspect mm -hmm. of this disease and the progression of it, which is you have a ton of neutrophils coming through, um, causing um, a lot of inflammation in response to this wild type infection. And that is not the case when you lack the pore forming toxin. So can we go further and understand, is pneumolysin, the toxin alone, sufficient to, to recruit neutrophils? And what we see in this follow-up experiment is yes. We, while we don't get any PMNs when we add the buffer as our negative control, we do see a consistent increase of neutrophils migrating in response to just the toxin alone. So there's no bacteria present. We're just adding purified toxin. And this um, does tail off towards this higher dose because we are um, adding so much toxin that we're starting to overwhelm the system. Um, there's just so much toxin that the cells are starting to 
um, get overwhelmed uh, by the amount we are adding, but we still see significant migration under these conditions. So right away, this is telling us that pneumolysin is playing um, a major role in driving this excessive amount of neutrophils to the site of the infection. You might wonder how else does pneumolysin contribute to the disease um, during streptococcus pneumonia infection. And unfortunately, um, I don't have time to tell you all the amazing things this toxin does, but I will briefly summarize it in this pathogen, um, the earlier pathogenesis slide I showed you, um, because a number of labs and research groups have documented that pneumolysin is actually important for every single one of these steps, whether it's colonizing our uh, nasopharynx, causing pneumonia and that inflammation, as well as escaping the lung and um, causing disease where it will spread systemically in our vasculature. So pneumolysin has been well established to um, promote disease throughout the infection. So in answer to our first question, what factors are driving disease? Well, one of the answers is definitely pneumolysin. And there are many other factors that I don't have time to talk about today, um, but I will expand further on the star of the show, this poor forming toxin, and show additional experiments on what this toxin is doing specifically, um, because it's well established that it's a major virulence factor, but how um, is this toxin um, impacting um, the progression of the disease? So I'm showing it here in green. So we know that the toxin is important, but now how is this toxin impacting our immune response, right? So our neutrophils down here. And specifically, we can revise this question to say, how does PLY impact this immune response? Before we get into that, we should talk about one of pneumolysin's most uh, or best characterized um, properties. And I um, have indicated this through the title of the talk. Um, it forms these holes in human cells. And we're going to zoom in here with our own virtual microscope, looking at this interaction a little closer. So what we can see is that we have streptococcus pneumoniae releasing this pneumolysin toxin, and it will bind to the host cell uh, membrane. And then this membrane binding will proceed to the formation of what is referred to as an early prepore complex. And so you'll have this prepore complex form on the host cell membrane, and that will then proceed to a late prepore complex. Um, and basically what you're having is this oligomerization event where these individual monomers are now connecting to one another um, and forming this prepore um, structure on the surface of the host cell until in the final step, it allows for the insertion of the toxin into the membrane of the host cell, ejecting this um, portion of the membrane um, and forming an actual pore or hole in the host cell. This then allows for the flux of different ions and small molecules that can go on to activate a number of signaling pathways, including those chemotractin pathways that I mentioned earlier. So we have this very well characterized property of pneumolysin, and we can now ask, how does this toxin impact our immune response? And specifically, how does the role of pore formation play into this um, progression of the disease? So again, we're looking at PMN migration, and what we can see here is that, again, as we might expect with buffer, we don't get any PMN migration. When we add just the purified pneumolysin toxin to our system of lung epithelial cells, we get significant neutrophil migration in response to this toxin. However, if we mutate this toxin into what is called a toxoid, um, this is a mutated version of the toxin, um, we can now add this toxoid that is stuck in the early prepore stage. It cannot proceed any further. So it is stuck at this stage. And when we add this toxoid, we do not get significant neutrophil migration. 
Similarly, we can make another version of this toxin a late prepore toxoid, so it's stuck in the prepore status and or state, and it also will not induce significant neutrophil migration. And finally, we can use a positive control. This is called f met -Lufi, and this is a molecule that is known to induce significant neutrophil migration, and we see that this, um, in fact, works as well. But the main takeaway is that only if you have a fully functional pneumoniasin toxin that can form a pore are you going to induce neutrophil migration. So how do the neutrophils migrate in response to pneumoniasin? We know what is required of the toxin itself, but what is the actual pathway that's leading the neutrophils to migrate? Other studies have already shown that it's not pneumoliasis in itself, so there must be some signaling pathway that is driving this response. And neutrophils are my favorite white blood cells for many reasons, um, and one of them is that they're able to respond to a variety of chemotract ingredients. Um, and we actually had the opportunity to write a literature review um, during the pandemic on this very topic. And you'll probably notice another pun here, getting your neutrophil or getting your fill of neutrophils. How do neutrophils migrate across the lungs? And this is basically um, a, I think a great article, although obviously I'm biased, but um, it was a great opportunity to work with two undergraduates in the lab writing uh, this literature review um, that highlights all of the fascinating chemotractic gradients that neutrophils um, use uh, to migrate towards um, the source of an infection. And while unfortunately I don't have time to walk you through the article, it is published and it does help us answer what chemotractin pathway um, pneumolysin can activate to elicit PMN migration. So you'll find a number of different um, <clears throat> discussions about what neutrophils are doing when they migrate, but you also find some figures that, like this one, which show the different steps that neutrophils undergo to squeeze through these junctional spaces and migrate to the um, other side of the lung epithelium. You'll also find some very colorful um, or complicated uh, diagrams that I will not walk you through right now, but again, there's there are science puns in here as well. So uh, there's a little bit of uh, stuff for everyone. And in the interest of time, I'll just narrow this down and show you that hypoxylin, which you may have remembered from early in the talk, is actually a pathway that we investigated. And what we found, again, looking at neutrophil migration, is that if you measure in response to buffer, you get nothing. If you measure in response to purified toxin, you get a significant response. If you measure neutrophil migration in response to the toxin, but also in the presence of a pharmacological inhibitor that prevents the synthesis of this hypoxylin molecule, you get a significant decrease in PMN migration. If we use a different inhibitor, we also get significant um, decreases in migration. And lastly, we see that there is significant migration in response to a positive control. All this together indicates that hypoxylin synthesis is required for neutrophils to migrate in response to pneumolysin. And so taken together, we can use these results to answer our question about how this impacts our immune response. Specifically, we have shown that pore formation and an active hypoxylin synthesis pathway are both required for robust PMN migration. And so you can see this cartoon image indicating that, in fact, there is this pore formation event, and this leads to hypoxylin synthesis. And in turn, that will generate the hypoxylin molecule, which can form a high to low gradient that allows the neutrophils to respond and go to the source of this hypoxylin release and bring them into this microbial combat with our streptococcus pneumoniae. So we've answered the second question, 
let's tackle the third. How do these microbial factors impact the structural integrity of our airways, right? Because right now we've shown that there are pores being formed, cells moving around, but what's actually happening structurally to the lung epithelium? Or more specifically, how does pneumoniasin impact this structural integrity? To answer that, we have utilized a range of techniques, including fluorescence microscopy. And what we see here is a, a microscopy image that is looking at a number of different signals. To orient you, the blue is DAPI, which stands for the cell uh, nucleus, specifically the DNA. We also have phalloidin, which is a little hard to make out in this image, but um, this is responsible for staining F-actin, which makes up the cytoskeletal framework of the lung epithelial cells. And then lastly, there is e cadherin which is our signal of interest for today's talk, um, which is that adherence junction uh, protein. So this is a main component of adherence junctions. And we can see that beautiful green mesh-like network that exists in between the cells. And so this is what it looks like when we have a mock infection or just with buffer, we see happy cells and e cadherin everywhere in that beautiful pattern. However, if we do an infection, the party is over and the bacteria have now disrupted that mesh-like network and we see very little green staining. This indicates that the adherence junction organization is disrupted. Now, if we do an infection with a delta pneumoniasin strain, so this is with the um, bacterial mutant lacking the pore forming toxin, we see that the green stain is present. And just to orient uh, the audience, the MOI here stands for multiplicity of infection, which is simply stating that there is two bacteria attacking each white blood cell, or sorry, lung, lung epithelial cell on average. So this sort of gives you an insight as to how we um, gauge the um, numbers of bacteria to lung cells, and this is considered a low dose infection. So we see there is a clear phenotype here, but there is only qualitative information. And at the end of the day, we are scientists and we do love our numbers. So is it possible to quantify this uh, disruption into numbers? And this is a question that I posed to my first graduate student, Devon Zmo, um, who would also wanted reliable numbers for these images. And he set out to develop a Python-based program using coding to measure this disruption. And this was also what we referred to as a pandemic pivot. So this is something that uh, was relying on a lot of virtual skills and a more limited set of hands-on skills, which I think is, as I reflect on the Adams Lab development, uh, just one more example of how creativity, both um, for asking the questions, but also how we solve them, uh, can really be pushed by uh, unforeseen events like the, the pandemic. So when we start with an image, we have all these different signals. So the first thing that this program does is it extracts the channel of interest. And in this case, we want to extract the green channel, which is our staining for e cadherin. And then the program uses some complex coding that we outline in the paper, uh, where it turns every pixel into a black pixel or a white pit pixel. So it makes it very black and white. And basically you have this organizational network of junctions that you can see here. And this uh, image is also normalized for any differences in staining intensity or dimness that might be due to um, older samples or differences in the antibodies that are used. And then it draws a line through the image. And this image, or sorry, the line will intersect with different junctions throughout the image. And the program can then count these uh, each time the line intersects a junction with these different peaks here. And we drew this one line, but why draw one line when you can draw a bunch of lines? 
And so this program counts all of the times, all of the lines intersect the different junctions, and then it divides all of those intersections by the number of pixels in the image. And this generates a measure of quantification, or this quantifies the organization of the um, junctions. So specifically, it's not just looking for the signal, but the presence of that mesh-like network that is very characteristic of intercellular junctions, or at least the intercellular junctions we're interested in. And so this program has uh, been really sort of a game changer for us, and we decided to name it, um, because all programs need a name, Intercellular Junction Organization Quantification, which I know is a bit of a mouthful. So for short, we call it iJoke because I love jokes and hopefully you love jokes. And if you wanna use this program because it's open source, uh, you can joke too and we can joke together, but you get it. I warned you there would be puns. And we were really excited about this program. So can we see how does iJoke assess the disruption of intercellular junction organization? And we took these same images, and these are just representative, representative images, but um, we looked at these images and we saw that these in combination with all the other images we took, um, we see a significant amount of disruption that takes place. And we next wanted to see, is purified pneumolysin sufficient to disrupt these junctions? So this was with a bacterial infection, and we see if we add increasing amounts of the toxin, we get significant disruption of the junctions. We also want to see if this is true for other pore-forming toxins. So is pneumolysin, um, a, pneumolysin belongs to other structurally similar toxins that also form pores called ILY and PFO. And once again, we see significant disruption both qualitatively and quantitatively. And this was very important because it also showed that um, this was not something specific to pneumolysin, but that other bacteria could be using to cause disease. We then want to see, is there a role for pore formation in this? And we looked at a mutant that is unable to bind to the uh, lung epithelial cells and we see that there is still a green present um, and that there is not significant disruption compared to the normal toxin. We also put this mutant that cannot bind back into bacteria and we see the same result as well. The last question we wanted to ask is how does this toxin um, disrupting E. cadherin in combination with the PMN migration impact strep pneumo infection, right? So putting this all together with all the other data I've shown you, what's happening at different infection parameters. And so the first set of data is something that is, I've shown you before. We see that a wild type infection induces significant neutrophil migration compared to a delta pneumoliasin strain. We can also look at this um, barrier disruption by measuring how much a fluorescent probe will transit across the barrier. The more, bar the more the probe crosses, the more disruption there is. And what we see here is that when they are mock infected with buffer or they are have no neutrophils present during the infection, we don't get barrier disruption. But a wild types infection in combination with the um, neutrophils leads to a significant amount of barrier disruption and a delta pneumoliasin strain uh, fails to cause this barrier disruption. At last, we see the same trend with bacterial transit crossing over and escaping across the lung epithelium. We see that only for a condition with wild type bacteria compare, or in the presence of neutrophils do we get significant bacterial um, escape um, across the lung epithelium. So we can take all of these findings together to inform our model of what's happening to the structural integrity of our airways. Pore formation by ply is disrupting adherence junctions as well as tight junctions. And I didn't have time to show you that data today. But in addition to that disruption, the neutrophils are migrating across and the 
barrier permeability is increasing and collectively this is leading to bacterial escape, excuse me, escape in the presence of PMNs. So we have lots of exciting directions and a lot of um, new questions to answer, including how does this pore formation disrupt the junctions? We think ion flux may be involved. What clinical therapies can we use to improve the expression of these junctions during infection since they're clearly being disrupted um, throughout the infection? And then more broadly, can these clinical therapies be used to fight other respiratory pathogens? For example, SARS-CoV-2 and Pseudomonas aeruginosa both have been shown to target junctions and disrupt lung epithelial permeability. So can we develop therapies that will broadly treat respiratory infections. With that, I would just like to thank my lab one more time, as well as um, all of the alumni that have come through, my collaborators at San Jose State. Um, working in the Interdisciplinary Science Building has been phenomenal for uh, crossing outside of your discipline to tackle problems together. Of course, all my previous collaborators, my NIH funding, and our first place Halloween costume from last year where we dressed up as microbes because why not get even nerdier while you're having fun. With that, I'm happy to take any questions and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Walter. That was just brilliant. I, uh, I really enjoyed the clarity of your presentation and um, the importance of your work, frankly. There are a number of questions, uh, so I will go ahead and start at the top. Does cannabis help or hurt these toxins in the lungs? Cannabis, the like cannabis as in marijuana? One presumes smoked cannabis, I guess, but maybe it doesn't have to be smoked. So that's a very uh, interesting question. Um, I would say that two... There are two important variables to consider. One, smoking in general is bad for your lungs. So if there is, yeah, one sort of overarching thing, anytime you're inhaling particulate, that is going to cause damage to your lungs. It's going to damage the permeability of your lungs and lead to impair lung function and making it easier for bacteria to colonize. Now, with that said, there actually does appear to be some evidence that uh, cannabis can suppress neutrophil migration to some degree. Um, that pathway hasn't been completely worked out, but there is a little bit of research I'm aware of showing that um, individuals who uh, have uh, partaken in cannabis uh, use um, have lower <laughs> neutrophil responses. And that can lead to lower neutrophils migrating. So there could potentially be some roll down the line, but for now I would say avoiding smoking is, is probably the best thing you can do for your lungs. All right, thanks. Uh, second question, uh, do you think wearing masks helps keep these toxins or presumably the bacteria out and can they enter through the eyes? Great questions, yes. so. These bacteria love mucosal surfaces in general, and that includes your eyes. So they will definitely uh, be able to cause disease there. They are most known for, or Streptococcus pneumoniae, as the name suggests, is most known for causing pneumonia. But um, yes, it can infect your eyes. And then back to the first part of definitely wearing a mask is an excellent way to protect yourself from this respiratory infection, just like it is an excellent way of protecting yourself from many or basically all respiratory infections, uh, as long as the mask is uh, fits well and is of appropriate um, pore size. And that I think is nicely supported by epidemiological data showing that when we wore masks during the pandemic, we saw a dramatic decrease in not just SARS-CoV-2 infections, but also influenza infections and other respiratory diseases. So it's another great, simple thing you can do to make yourself uh, safer from these infections. Thank you. Um, the next question, after saying thanks for a great talk, Walter, asks, what is the benefit to the bacterium 
for the host to end up with pores uh, forming in their cell membranes and all the downstream effects of this? Great question. Yeah, so I think it's important to try to put yourselves in the in the shoes, even though bacteria don't really wear shoes, but put put yourself in the bacteria's shoes and see what are what are its life goals, right? And when you think about what a bacteria wants, it wants the same thing as us. It wants to live, it wants to thrive, it wants to grow. Maybe one day buy a house. Okay, maybe not that. But um, this idea of survival. And so really the bacteria will live and colonize our nasopharynx, our upper respiratory tract. And it's really sort of an accident that it comes down to the lungs, right? The pneumoniacin toxin is able to help it spread, but it also helps it defend itself in these more hostile environments. And so this, this bacteria in the lungs, it, it doesn't have an evolutionary benefit per se, because it's in the lungs and it's just fighting and surviving and growing and causing chaos, but it's really um, the ability of pneumolysin to help it spread from one person's nasopharynx to the other that allows it to thrive and spread um, across populations. So it it's still a very potent weapon. And in the lung capacity, it's more of like, hey, I'm still here to live and survive. And this is helping me fight in this area, but it serves sort of a, a different role there. Thank you. Um, I don't know if I understand this next question. I'll ask it, perhaps you will. Uh, can this be applied to viral infections or lung cancer? I'm going to guess that they are connecting maybe the clinical therapies. Um, and so... With regards to, let's just take SARS-CoV-2, for example, uh, studies have shown that SARS-CoV-2 is able to disrupt intracellular junctions. And so the thought or the, the hope, at least, is that therapies we develop to improve um, adherence junction or tight junction expression, uh, this could be through specific uh, clinical molecules that are in development or possible steroids or vitamins, which have been shown to, to boost uh, intracellular junction expression, that the appropriate administration of these and possibly in conjunction with some other therapies can be used to fight off not just bacterial infections that damage our lungs, but also viral infections. With regards to cancer, the progression of cancer itself is... Uh, distinctly different from these microbial infections in the sense that cancer is just uncontrolled nonstop growth. And that's not really focused at disrupting the junctions per se. Instead, it just has uncontrolled growth and that spreads throughout your body and drains its resources. So I don't think the clinical therapies would be the same for those two diseases. Thank you. Uh, the next questioner uh, says that they have a question regarding the migration of PMNs when comparing the infections of wild type and Delta uh, PLY in your in vitro transwell experiments. Are there treatments or methods available to inhibit or reduce the amount of cells affected with PLY in our body when we visualize, see the expression of uh, S. Uh, pneumoniae? Uh, sorry, can you read that one more time? I, yeah, I, yeah there's I'm a lot sorry. Of... I, didn't, I didn't read it very well. I apologize to the questioner. Are there treatments or methods available to inhibit or reduce the amount of cells affected with PLY in our bodies when we visualize uh, the expression of S. pneumoniae? Yeah, um, not, or, so good question for sure. I would say not that, I am aware of. So this this is a, a challenge for the field to some degree where the pneumoniasin toxin is released by streptococcus pneumoniae, but there is no uh, secretion signal for the toxin. And so trying to block it from attacking our cells gets a little tricky because 
the mechanism the the release mechanism itself is is very hard to characterize um and that is further characterized by the fact that um antibodies to the toxin do not seem to be neutralizing so because pneumomycin itself can change undergo this dramatic conformational change in shape the regions the antibodies are recognizing don't inhibit the pneumomycin from causing damage. So it's a very sort of elusive protein in that way. Um, so our antibodies have trouble recognizing it effectively. And the last thing I'll say is that when Streptococcus pneumoniae lyses, it is thought that lots of pneumomycin can also be released. And so predicting when that happens can also be very tricky for when you would even administer that therapy if, if we had one. Thank you. The next question uh, references your website, walteradamslab.com, and it asks, um, what did we hear about the piece of DNA that was stranded on an island? Oh my gosh. Yeah, so um, I, as you probably have gathered, there are a lot of opportunities for humor in science and especially in, in my lab. The, the joke is sort of tongue in cheek. Um, have you heard about the piece of DNA that was stranded on an island? And the, the joke is that DNA is stranded already, so it's stranded on an island. So it's always stranded on an island because DNA is double-stranded. So that is that is sort of the joke there. And hopefully um, that was worth the wait. Thank you. Uh, is it possible for these kinds of infections to stick around and flare up? Yeah, so um, I guess... Stick around is, um, it, I guess it's relative with what the time time course is meant, but we can have uh, asymptomatic colonization of Streptococcus pneumoniae in our nasopharynx right now and be totally fine. If you're a healthy adult, you are going to be more likely to control that infection should even a small amount of the bacteria try to transit into your lungs. Um, but certainly if you are colonized, right, that is the first step. And if you are immunocompromised, you have um, some other chronic illness, um, if you uh, have other lung um, sort of disease already, right, that could make you susceptible to recurrent infections. And fortunately, we still have antibiotics that can treat this disease, but antimicrobial or antibiotic resistance to these antibiotics is rapidly growing. And so um, we definitely need new therapies to try to help these infections or help clear these infections because uh, the more resistance that grows, right, the more recurrent infections we're going to get and the bigger this problem is going to become. Thanks, Walter. So we're almost out of time. We have one minute left and uh, there's still several questions. So I'm just going to pick one and we'll make this the final question. Is that all right, Walter? Sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, so this question is, uh, what types of existing immune systems can resist the effects of the whole inducing toxins? One more time. Just want to make sure I'm getting what, all this. What types of existing immune systems can resist the effects of the whole inducing toxins? Well, uh, sorry to end on a sort of a win for the bacteria here, but uh, the toxin can basically form pores in all host cell or all human cells. And so um, whether it's our adaptive immune system or our innate immune system, this toxin loves to form pores in our cells. And so that's why we need to continue working on developing these therapies to try to figure out how can we help our white blood cells fight back um, and do so in a way that's not so aggressive that it causes more damage uh, than help in the immune response? Excellent. Thank you so much, Walter. With that, uh, let's end our presentation for today. I want to thank you, uh, Walter, for a really wonderful uh, talk. And I also want to thank our audience for taking the time today to come to the University Scholar presentation. Look forward to seeing you all at the next University Scholar presentation. Thank you.